My name is Travis Thurston, and I'm an instructional designer in the Center for Innovative Design and Instruction, uh, part of Academic and Instructional Services. Uh, and it's my pleasure to introduce you to Mitchell Culver today. Uh, Mitchell is a doctoral student in education at USU. He holds a master's degree in experimental psychology and a bachelor's in psychology and music. Uh, his research focuses on a, a broad range of topics that emphasize human potential, agency, and growth. He has taught courses in psychology, music psychology, education, courtship and attraction, diversity, and leadership. Just a few things. Uh, he currently works in the Office of Student Orientation uh, and Transition Services at USU, uh, where he studies factors that influence the success of students' transition to the university experience. I'll give the floor to Mitchell. Thanks, Travis. Can you hear me okay if I don't use the microphone? Is that all right? I don't want to be trapped behind the podium. There's some handouts that uh, went out, um, there's more on their way. So when they get here, hopefully they'll circulate to those who haven't received them already. I'm really pleased to be with you at this time. And I'm really excited to be topic, talking about this topic because it's one that's near and dear to my heart. It's a shorter presentation time, 35 minutes. And normally I would want to unpack a lot of the philosophy and some of the science behind uh, inert knowledge and subject object orientations in your classroom. But we don't have time to really unpack it, so I'm going to move through this first section fairly quickly. And that will give us more time to spend on some of the applicable tools that you can actually take and use in your classrooms and with your students. So to start, I want to talk about humans and our potential. We know this from comparative psychology that humans are the finest learning organisms that exist or have ever existed. We have large amounts of cortical matter, this green area on the outside of the brain, and that's where we do most of our thinking, our, our thinking thoughts, like where we're getting judgments and doing these kinds of things. At the, the more, um, uh, less advanced systems of the brain, uh, in the red and yellow areas, those are structures that are shared by animals in the animal kingdom. You know, crocodiles have a lot of the same things that we have, but they don't think a lot of thoughts. Most of what they're doing is on instinct. But we, um, because we have this large amount of sort of cortical matter, we're doing a lot of thinking, and we're doing it in exceptional ways. Uh, you can compare our brain to other animals, like a rat and cat. You have similar structures. In the human brain, the green section, there's the parietal lobe. A cat has a parietal lobe. It's just not nearly as big or complex. So does a rat. It's less advanced. We have temporal lobes where we have memories. Cats have them too, just not as much. Same with rats. And then we have occipital lobe, same thing, in the cat and the rat. But you'll notice we also have these more folds the more surface area of the brain those folds create, the, the more thinking you're going to be doing as an organism. So you can compare it to a rat. They're not doing much thinking at all. We have the largest mass of cortical matter com compared to our body mass than of the, any other animal. Relative mass is just massive. Uh, elephant's brain may be large, but compared to their body size, it's not as big as our brain. It's very exciting. We are wired to learn. And I'm afraid that we too often take that for granted in our classrooms. And lectures especially take advantage of that fact. It's, it's sad that in conferences like this that we are tied to these formats because they're so ubiquitous and they've become what's called reified to the point that we don't even question a bunch of people sitting in rows like this and I'm here and I'm going to speak to you and this is going to be a great thing and you're going to go away and be changed. But we know that that's actually not very true. Uh, we know that by and large formats like this are not conducive to long-term human growth. And it's sad because that reification that's taken place, where we just come to accept it as, as, of course, well, it's ubiquitous, so why should we question it? This is problematic. There's a big argument going on, especially in, amongst philosophers and journalists, about whether or not lectures are useful. Um, uh, the lecture has been defended in the New York Times and in the Atlantic. It's also been attacked in those same venues. And um, there's something to be said of that. Uh, bad lectures are bad. But great lectures are great. And you can have something that's, that's really engaging and really dynamic that does, in fact, change people's thinking. This is a justice course that's taught at Harvard. It's one of the most popular courses in the world. It's uh, available online, and it's widely attended um, through download. And, um, and it's engaging. It's fun. It's, it's interesting, and it makes one think. But great lectures are not often happening. Great lectures, like TED Talks, for example, 
are rare so that when they happen, they get shared virally, right? Uh, I would like you to think back to your freshman English course and try to think about how many of those lectures would be worth going viral over, right? We, we don't really think that way often, and it's a sad thing. As we turn to the world of philosophy to inform our discussion, we, we can turn to uh, Kant and Hegel and Marx, and they were kind of a family of philosophers who talked about subject-object relations. And it's very simple to understand this. The subject is the person who has choices, the person who's active, is the person who's in charge and who has power. Any time you have an organizational structure full of people, there's going to be people who are the subjects of that organizational structure. They have power, they make decisions, they exercise that power, and they're allowed to be active and free in that space. But you also have people who become objects. Objects are those who are having things done to them, who are not doing things, who are not making choices, but who are having choices made for them or on their behalf, often for the betterment of the whole, and often in very oppressive ways. And that's problematic. It's extremely problematic because when you ask yourself, do I want to sit in front of this guy with his back turned to me while he writes on the board for three hours? You may start to feel this idea of like, maybe we can be oppressive in our classrooms, and maybe that's problematic. When you ask the question, who or what is the subject of the lecture, it might be easy to say, well, mathematics is the subject of the lecture. Chemistry is the subject of the lecture. But I think it's often hard for us to accept that often what we mean by mathematics or by chemistry is I as the instructor in the subject and the students as they sit in the chairs there, they'll be the objects and I'll, I'll present to them and we'll, we'll do what Paulo Freire, the Brazilian um, educational philosopher, he said it's this banking model of education where you open up a student's brain and you make deposits just like you would at a bank and then you close it up and it's all going to just work out and that's super problematic. Looks like the, the handouts have arrived. Thank you, Sue Lin. And let's just kind of hand them and then hope that they get across. If you want to just hand them there to Eric and then as a stack, they'll get across. And then you can sit down, Sue, thanks. Um, so we asked the question, what's the subject of a, of a classroom? And it's a really important uh, question to ask is, is, do you teach chemistry or do you teach students? Because aren't students the subject of the classroom? Aren't they meant to be the ones who are in control, making choices, and using that space to grow? And using that space to become something that they weren't when they walked in? I have a lot of times students will come to me after class, and they'll say, Professor Culver, I never heard that before. What you just taught there, I've never heard that. And I say, well, of course, that's why you're here. <laughs> you're here to hear something you never heard before. Now, what are you going to do with it? Let's, let's make you the... Let's make you the subject rather than me or rather than the course content, the subject. Now, uh, we turn to, to Freire to understand how when a student is made the object of the classroom that can feel oppressive and be oppressive and problematic. He says this, education, when it's used as the exercise of domination, it stimulates the credulity of students. In other words, it stimulates them to want to believe things stimulates them to be receptacles of knowledge. It stimulates their credulity, and often with the ideological intent, often not perceived by the educators. It's not like educators sit in their, their faculty rooms and they say, ooh, we're really going to oppress these students today. I'm looking forward to that. It's often not perceived of, of this intent of indoctrinating them to adapt to the world of oppression. And what does that mean? Jean Anion, back in 1979, she went into some classrooms on the East Coast and she did some really amazing work. And what she looked at was children of blue-collar workers. What kind of math instruction were they receiving in the classrooms? And what she found is, is that the, the math instruction was all procedural based. Uh, they weren't learning why they were doing the math. They were just learning, follow step one, which will lead you to step two, and that will take you to step three. And then Anion went into classrooms of white-collar worker uh, children. And they were learning the procedures, but they're also learning some of the why. And this is why you do it, and this is the thinking behind it. And then she went to classrooms of children of CEOs and you know, fund managers and stuff. And they were learning math, but they were learning math as the subject of the classroom. They were being encouraged to ask questions, to explore those questions through the scientific method, to, to answer those questions actively and with manipulatives, to perhaps leave the classroom in order to answer those questions. And Jean Anion called this 
the hidden curriculum of our classrooms where we were teaching blue collar worker children to follow procedures so that when they grow up, they can take their parents' place in a factory that the only thing you're asked to do is follow procedures. And when white collar workers grow up or the children grow up, they're being asked to supervise the people who are doing the procedures, but to also understand why those procedures are taking place. And then the children, the CEOs and the fund managers to grow up and to actually ask the questions and make the questions and in fact write the script of what everyone else is gonna be doing. And so she said, this is a hidden curriculum. It's a problematic curriculum because it's oppressive. And it, it socially reconstructs or re recreates the problems that have existed in the previous generation. They will just re-manifest themselves in the following generation. So this is a problem. And we see it in the literature. We see it in the research. It's not just philosophy of education. It's real. We know that this is true. And we can look at some examples of this. Uh, in Finland, for example, we know that the Finnish system is not only uh, outscoring other nations, hands down, and also states. It's really important to think about Finland and compare it to Massachusetts and not compare it to the United States, because the United States is a federation of states, so it's managed differently than a single right, socialist nation in Northern Europe. So even when you compare Finland to somewhere like Massachusetts or Nevada or New Jersey, Finland's just outstripping everyone. And the reason is, is because they focus on this ethic that true human growth occurs through experience, not hearing explanations, and that this liberates the student uh, and in a way that unlocks their human spirit and their human potential. It's very exciting, and it's working in Finland. And they, they write in their papers, they write this, this fear that they have. They look at our system, and they call it a neoliberal system. This is a term that means we're, we're so focused on testing, and we're focused on the core standards and all these things, and it's called neoliberalism, and they say, you know, neoliberalism doesn't work, Finland knows that, but it's so addictive to want to be more like the United States that neoliberalism is even starting to creep into Finnish classrooms, even though they're at the top. In other words, even though they're doing what's working, they're starting to have this uh, cross-contamination of, of assessment rise up to the end oh, we have, to, we have to fight this. And that's just in the last year that they've been writing about this in Finland and how they're scared of it. So how does this suppression lead to inert knowledge? The title of the presentation is Inert Knowledge, How to Avoid Inert Knowledge and Make Students the Subject of Your Classroom. How does this oppressive stance of the lecture of making the content the issue rather than the students the issue, how does it lead to inert knowledge? Well, we can look at this model of the lecture and the test, right? So we give a lecture to students, they sit and they listen, and, and they're supposed to absorb that. Then we test them on it, and if they get all the right answers, and they're 100%, oh, well, they learned it. This is great. Now they can move on to their life. But what we know is we follow those people three to five years later into the real world. And they're presented with questions and problems that the knowledge that they were supposed to acquire in their college education is immediately relevant. The knowledge that they were supposed to acquire in their college education is immediately relevant to the problems that they're attempting to solve, and they don't realize that. In other words, their knowledge is inert. They've never used it to solve real problems. They've used it to answer multiple choice questions. And they got 100, so then they learned it. But because they never were presented with a real true to form in vivo experience of applying that knowledge and problem solving using it, then in the real world, they, they, they're, they, they're at a loss. I don't, I don't know how to solve this. He said, well, didn't you learn this principle and this principle and this principle in your, in your class? And they go, well, yeah, but what does that have to do with this? Well, this is the same problem. Oh, oh, I see that. Okay. Now, some evidence at MIT, they had um, some freshmen, uh, physics majors, biology majors, political science majors. They took a mechanics course, and they all did well on the test. So as freshmen, they're all doing well. They get this mechanics information. Then there's a three-year interim. Uh, for biology and political science majors, the mechanics is never used. It's never addressed. It was addressed once as freshmen. Was their coursework, anything that they've been assigned, doesn't require them to use that knowledge. And the, but the physics majors, you'll notice, physics is mechanics-oriented. And so they have this continued use of knowledge during the interim. And then you retest the whole group as seniors. And what you see is, is, is yes, there's a loss. There, there's always a loss. Memory, memory is that way, isn't it? Um, we lose memories. There's lots of reasons for it. They're not all bad. They actually help us to survive and be good. But uh, in this case, 
uh, of course, the knowledge that had been used or had been actively used during the interim, uh, there's a lot less loss. And on the order of, of nearly twice as much forgetting for students who learn something, get 100%, and then do nothing with it. And how sad is that? Now, this is an engineering education journal that published these, these results, which I think are better than the MIT results, really makes the point, brings it home. We have an assessment there in the blue. This is a pre-knowledge learning environment assessment. How much do you know about these topics? And this is the percent of students that demonstrated that they grasped the concept before instruction occurred in the blue, right? Velocity is apparently easier to understand for most people. Then there's a lecture given, and in, in one group, here's a lecture, and how much do you know now? And you'll notice a slight increases. Now, this is not amount of knowledge gained. This is number of students who grasped the concept. And then, of course, we use these student-centered methods where they are the subject. They're actively engaged in applying the knowledge in real life, in vivo situations. And suddenly, you jump from the number of students that are understanding the concept, 21 and 5, all the way up to almost 9 and 10, and then above 9. And it's just amazing. Now, this makes the point, the same point that's about the, the Finnish education. Finnish education works well for all of, the, all of the people in Finland, all of the students. It works well for them. They're not just getting high test scores from their highest end learners. They're getting high test scores from everyone. Everyone is benefiting from the Finnish education system. In, in our system of lecturing that we use so much, there are students that do well, and we use those students as an excuse to continue doing what we're doing. And that's what I see here, is this lecturing, the orange, whoops, excuse me, the orange bars. Here, if I were to give a test and 55% of the students at the top after the lecture, they were to understand it, I said, well, job well done. My duty's over. But we're a land-grant institution, which means we don't just serve the top 55% or the top 30% or the top 20%, we have to serve all of our students. And in serving all of our students, we need to do what works, which works best for the average in the aggregate. In other words, the average student in the aggregate is what works best for almost everyone. And you can see that here, almost everyone benefiting from these subject-centered, uh, student-centered, active learning type, um, type activities. Now, so then what can we do about it? That's why we're here. That's the background. And I moved through it pretty quick. I hope you found it interesting. Now let's get into what, what can we do. And when I ask that question, the word intentionality comes to mind. Uh, Bob Slavin, he's, a, he's an internationally re renowned educator, and he writes textbooks. He's done a lot in, in the field of education. And w in one of his books, Educational Psychology, he he has a, a section specifically on the word intentionality. And it's a short section, but when I taught this course in Washington about educational psychology, we wrote this out on giant posters, and we hung them all over the classroom and left them up the whole semester. Intentionality is, and I don't remember the exact wording, but you can imagine it has something to do with planning intentionally and taking a moment to actually not walk into the classroom and shoot from the hip and not walk into the classroom and just say, well, lecture is all that is expected of me, so lecture is all that I have to provide. Intentionality is where you, you're constant, consciously saying, we have students who are coming with various diverse backgrounds. I'm meant to be an environment of growth. I'm meant to provide that for them. And then out the other end, they're supposed to come out improved. I'm supposed to take them from where they're at put them through some interesting experience, and then on the other side, they're supposed to be better human beings. And when you're intentional, you ask yourself the question, well, what am I doing in order to accomplish that? Where are they coming from? How, how am I planning my curriculum in a way that actually activates these students, that, that helps them? It, do I have a section of my course content that I'm just doing because I feel like it needs to be done because it's in chapter three. And they have to take a chapter three test, so we might as well go over it. And if we're gonna go over it, we might as well use a PowerPoint because that's what's ubiquitous, that's what's expected. And so then we'll do that and then they'll benefit, it'll be great. That's not intentionality. So we're gonna talk about curriculum planning. Now, I, I have to say this next slide is very exciting. This is the Oliva model for curriculum development. I learned this 
from Eric Moore, who's actually present. So this is a shout out to Eric. Um, this was in our curriculum planning class in my doctoral studies. And um, when he first showed us this model in the text, um, it has a lot of steps. And I've tried to make it easier to look at. I don't know if this is easy to look at. But if you saw the textbook page, maybe I should have put that up here first. And it would have been like, uh. And then I don't know, remember what the assignment was. But we had to engage this model. And it was a very frustrating assignment for, for Eric to give us. I remember sitting there going, this model is too many steps. It's too big. And then as the lecture unfolded, and as we got into our discussion groups and began to unpack it in the Socratic uh, kind of seminar where we each had a say in different things that were going on, we, we suddenly started to realize, no, it's not a large number of steps. It's just a few steps across the top there. And they're just, they're just broken down. And then you could start to, you know, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? And you could start to unpack this and really get used to it. So I don't expect to throw this up here and for you to go, oh, this Oliver model is just the solution to everything. Because it's not. And it's also confusing. But I do want to spend some time on it. I do want to spend some time on it because I think it's important. Uh, there's a lot of steps to curriculum planning. We look at the benefits for the students and for the society. We ask ourselves, why are we here? Why does the institution exist? I don't think many instructors sit down and say, how is my course supposed to benefit society? We pass those through some filters, through our philosophy of education and through the psychology of learning, because certain things help students learn and other things don't. And we can show that in the brain. Then we look, do the subject analysis. For whom are we working? The needs of the student, the needs of the discipline, the needs of the course content. And then we organize our curriculum and instruction. And then often, I think, we skip over this step, this formative evaluation. Uh, most of the time, the formative evaluation is just evaluation that takes place in the middle of class. It's, it's two-fold purposes. First, you want to know where your students are at. So oftentimes, it's low stakes. So I just want to know where the knowledge check is so to see how I'm doing as a professor. But that's the other point, is this formative assessment is meant to inform your practice while the thing is happening so that you can change your course design if you need to. And I think that that column gets left out almost entirely from a lot of, of planning, curriculum planning. And then we do summative evaluation design, which that's the final test, like how we finally test them in the end, summative meaning at the end. And if we do it appropriately, we also reflect on our own performance in a summative manner at the end of the term or the end of the year. We say, how did this go? Now, I, from having co planned co courses, both for myself and for others, I know how this goes. And it looks like this. This is the, this is the I've been given a course to teach, and I got two months to get it ready, and so I'm going to do this. And this is what it looks like. This one. Sorry. The green. Only the green. So we always start, what's the needs of the course content? So we get the book out. We look, what are the chapters? What is all the material we have to cover? What are the needs of the course content? Well, all the stuff I have to get through. And then we pass that through curriculum objectives, which is what we're going to actually do. OK, how are we going to cover chapter 2? How are we going to have to cover chapter 3? We organize it. Maybe I want to do chapter 15 before chapter 11 or something like this. And then, oh, uh, instructional design? I don't have time for that. I'm going to lecture. And then we're going to test at the end. It'll be great. And I've done this. I've seen other people do it. I've sat through 10 years of college experiences where this is being done. And I can see it happening. And now that I have more maybe experienced eyes, I can see it play out when the instructor walks into the room and starts their first lecture, comes in the second week and starts their first lecture. And I go, oh, this is just, this is the green path. We're, we're doing the needs of the, I'm an object in this situation. I'm supposed to sit here for the next, you know, 43 hours of this course content and just sponge this up and just, just benefit from it by default, right? Now, you have some really exciting, engaging teachers. I think if you want to expand this, it looks like this. It's the yellow and green. We really do start with the needs of the discipline. We think a little bit more intentionally about maybe how this course might be a prereq for another course. We might think about um, the career planning that needs to go in. And so we do that. And then we do the needs of the course content. Then we might actually set curriculum goals and say, OK, well, if we need to meet these needs for the discipline and the course content, then we really need to have specific goals that are articulated. Then we do the objectives and the organization. And then we select instructional strategies, which is great. 
it's, it's moving in the right direction. And then if we're really good, we'll do some formative assessment or evaluation, but only on the students. So we'll do knowledge checks for them, but we rarely use it to inform our practice. We say, okay, well, I just want to see how you're doing so that maybe I'll just give another lecture on the same content, right? I'm going to re-lecture about that because you guys couldn't understand it. And then we'll evaluate the students, and if we're doing really great, then we'll do this reflective evaluation of how we did at the end, but we'll only do that at the end. And then we repeat, right? Rinse, lather, repeat. So, so this is kind of a step up. I've seen this happen a lot, and it's great. As long as we're moving towards betterness, and we're doing it actively, and we don't get stalled, we're doing great. This is not to, to indict anyone here. We're doing great just by being in this room, because it's optional. We're doing great because we want to get better. We don't have to do the whole all of the model. I'm going to show you at the end that I don't do the whole all of the model. I reject aspects of it handily. Just get out of here. I don't care. So OK. Now, here's some things that I've learned in my PhD uh, in education. I came from a background in psychology. I don't really, um, I didn't know a lot about education. I'm learning a lot still. It's very exciting. Um, I was just over at Edith Bowen this morning in a kindergarten class as they were getting ready for the school year, learning. Just sitting there, soaking in, how are they getting ready, what is this, and all the things, so that I could know more things. But there's some things that I realize in this chart that only doctoral students in education care about. And maybe some other people too. And it's these red things. I don't think that, by and large, anyone else thinks about the purposes of education. We talk about a, a lot in education. If I say the name Lara B. 1997, then we know that this is what that's about, right? But how many people read Lara B. 1997, Purposes of Public Education? We don't read that. So by and large, I feel like if you don't do those steps, you're probably OK. You can rely on policy analysts to tell you what the purpose of education is or something. The philosophy of education, just to unpack all the different philosophies, takes a whole course. This is a philosophy, and this is a philosophy. Which one is your philosophy? There's multiple ones. You've got to pick a club. Um, so a lot of people don't have time. They, they kind of know what their philosophy of education is kind of intuitively. They don't need a, a name for it that's used in literature. Same thing with the psychology of learning. There's so much to learn about the psychology of learning, what works and what doesn't. People just don't have time for that. Instructional goals versus instructional objectives. This is the other thing. Is it's like, what's all these goals and objectives and outcomes? Why are all these words for the same thing? Isn't a goal an objective and an outcome? It's all the same thing. The finish line, isn't that what we're talking about? But no, educators make it really complicated. We have different names for different things. Objectives are what you actually do to reach the outcomes, and the goal is the overarching thing that you're trying to accomplish at the end. But we make it really complex, so we don't expect you to know all these nuances. But then I thought, well, if I'm going to present on this, what do I need to share? And I thought, well, I can tell them about this because I do this and I love it. This is, um, this is me in the classroom saying, I want to know how this is working for the students, and I want to know in the third week of class so that I have the other 12 weeks to fix it. So what I do is, this is formative. It's formative, meaning it's going to help me form the class. I can't form the class without having met the students. I need three weeks to get to know them before I can form the class so that they're the subject rather than the object of my preparation. And so this is what I do. I take this document in about one quarter way through whatever the class is. So in a 15-week class, it's week three, week four. And I say, here's everything. And I line it out because I'm intentional. I know everything that we've done. Every single instructional thing that I did, that I planned, appears in this list. We played a game. We did a discussion of the hero's journey. We talked about the I Wish song and goal setting. We did all these things. And then I just tell them, work with a partner, so you're not super biased, but work with a partner and together agree on what order you would rank these. What worked best for you and what didn't work for you at all? What do you want to see more of and what do you want to see less of in this class? Because it's your class, you're the subject of this class, and I want to design the class for you. Then this takes literally, in the, in the, I started at class, it takes literally 12 minutes to get done. So it's not robbing instructional time. It's 12 minutes. And then I gather it up, and I take it back to my desk that very day, and I put it in Excel. Again, this takes 12 minutes. I run some simple formulas to get the average, to so get the standard devi deviation. The reason why I do that is because I not only want to know what their average answer is on any of the 12 elements, 
but I also want to know the level of agreement. So here, the standard deviation means the green ones, like the 2.2 and the 2.22, they, they all agreed that this was one of the best things, letter I. They, they not only liked it, but there was a strong level of agreement about it. Same thing, this letter E, it got a low ranking. These are rankings, right? So 10 is bad. It's 10th of all the things. And they had strong agreement that they didn't like it. And then the ones that are red standard deviation is it's a mixed bag. Some people really thought it was great. Like in this first column, you'll see there's ones. You'll also see there's tens. So then that's some interesting questions to answer for me as the instructor. And almost instantaneously, as you group and you do a content analysis, patterns emerge instantly. In this example, what they liked was PowerPoints with pictures and stories, and um, then discussion activities mixed in. They loved that. And the top four things that they ranked were all PowerPoints with pictures and stories, and the discussion elements mixed in. The things that they were kind of middle of the road on were all the games where I get them up and get to know each other. Some people loved getting to know each other and playing these games where I I'll throw this ball around and get to know each other. And some people hated it. Well, then I say, well, that's fine. And then the things they didn't like were the, the lectures. And this is, this is the lectures where um, it was content that I had not designed, but that I had to implement as part of the course. And so it was very much like, we're going to talk about this. We're gonna, and I was given slides, so it was very much lecture. And so then that immediately steered the rest of the whole semester. And it gave me the whole rest of the time to make it up to them with more of the same stuff that they wanted. A question. Love it. It's a perfect question. So again, we, we have to go back to those filters, right? Just because every voice should be heard does not mean that every voice should be weighed the same way. And so I actually deleted this off of this because I felt like it was kind of an elitist thing to do. But I have students who I know are hardworking students. And I know that I have them put their names on it. So I actually rerun the same rankings. And I actually exclude all the students that have not demonstrated to me in the first three weeks that they're really there to learn and that they're really there to be dedicated. And so I get a second set of rankings from the, the more engaged and dedicated students. And those rankings help me inform even more. Like, how can I push these people? How can I challenge them? And again, passing that through all those filters of the psychology of education and things like this, I'm not going to let it be democracy mob rule, right? Just because I'm asking for them and their input doesn't mean that I'm not going to use my experience to filter that, that feedback and, and give to them a, a, a solid return on that, on that short investment of time. Does, does that answer your question? So I'm not beholden to them, but it does make them the subject of my planning. So that's one thing that can be done very simply, very easy to implement. And we're short on time. Uh, this, I can make this point super quick. This last square gets passed over too often. Because what it takes is a person who says, in order to be the kind of instructor that I want to be, I have to sit down and create a full, free space of reflection on how it went so that I can make it better for the future. Because by the time we sit in the grades, we're haggard, and it's vacation time, and so we leave, and we go, oh, I'll come back to it next autumn and I'll deal with it then. But the time to reflect is then. And just quickly, there's this intentional planning, trial, error, reflection, and an intentional revision, and then rinse, slather, repeat. It's this self iterate You have to create a space to have a conversation with yourself, or it won't happen. Because by the time you're a faculty member, nobody's looking over your shoulder. And if they are for the first six years, you get through that, and then it's easy to fall back on, on not being as effective as you could be. Here's the full Oliva model. Here's how I adapt it for myself. These are the things I care about. You can see there's a, a reduction of content. And I think everyone should do that. I'm really thankful to have been here. Um, we just have maybe just time for one question. Does anyone have anything pressing that they want to ask about? That makes it easy on me. Thanks for your time. It's been fun.